Let's begin our discussion of meat with a look at the structure of meat at the molecular level and the cellular level. Meat, of course, is usually referring to the skeletal muscle of mammals, although we'll also wind up talking a little bit about fish today, and we'll leave crustaceans, shellfish, aside completely, although we will usually consider that their flesh to be meat as well. But sticking with mammals for a while, here up at the upper left we have a, a diagram of, of uh, mo some molecular structures of meat um, for uh, beef or cow meat. Mammalian muscle is built of myosin molecules that pull actin filaments along. What am I talking about there? So let's look here. We have this sort of gray tube represents one kind of protein called myosin. That's a that's a machine, a molecular machine, that ratchets its way along these other protein molecules called actin filaments, using ATP as a sort of energy source for driving a molecular motion that winds up pulling one molecule across the other. That at the molecular level is muscle contraction. You can see then that as one molecule draws itself along the other we go from this extended structure to this contracted structure. Now these myofibrils right, are down here at the molecular level we're talking about myofibrils will bind many many of these myofibrils together in a single muscle cell and here's here's a muscle cell and you can see that here again too is a muscle cell built from many myofibrils and those muscle cells are packed together in something called a fascicle and um, that's made up of who, who knows maybe as many as a dozen um, muscle cells and these are wrapped in a connective tissue. Now this slide shows a lot of different names, a lot of terminology um, for the anatomy of muscle cells. We're not, we're not so concerned about that. What I want you to get a sense of here is how the con layered construction is built up from a single protein fiber all the way up to a muscle, a piece, uh, what, what you would recognize as a muscle, and at, along the way there are several layers of connective tissue. So very important for us, obviously, are these proteins. We know that mo muscle, that meat is very high in protein, but we also have to deal with connective tissue in in um, coping with with cooking. What would otherwise could otherwise be a tough product. In terms of the function, this photograph from your text is meant to represent muscle contraction, and it's a little bit difficult to see, but y you can begin if you look very closely to see all these bands here running length what running crossways across these muscle fibers this represents this if we look back to the left here this sort of uh, referred to as the i band this band of um, protein that that ties down the myosin filaments so really the muscle fibers are running this direction along the muscle and then in the in the relaxed version we see here um, and then here we look at the contracted version and we can see those muscle fibers have been have been shortened and or the structure altered in some way again using ATP adenosine triphosphate that's the energy currency of most living systems as a fuel source for driving this structural change in the protein all right let's talk about meat nutrition for a moment the good is that obviously protein uh, is important and muscle is an excellent source of protein. We'll talk, we've already mentioned what the, one of the main proteins in muscle is, myosin and actin. Um, we'll talk about other proteins in a few minutes. Aside from protein though, meat is a wonderful B vitamin source. These are water soluble vitamins. Um, this is just a laundry list of a lot of vitamins uh, not so important for us to think about them individually at this point. For those of you that are interested, however, I have broken them out into two different categories, and we won't delve further into the biochemistry of that. Uh, aside from saying that riboflavin and niacin, vitamins B2 and B3, are principally involved in oxidation reduction reactions, and if you don't know what that is, really let's just think about it as transferring of electrons from one place to another, as distinct from 
group transfer reactions, which are the rest of these B vitamins that I've listed here, thiamine B1, pantothenic acid B5, pyridoxal B6, biotin B7, folic acid B9, and cobalamins, which is a group of vitamins collectively known as the B12s. Group transfer, what I'm talking about here, is functional groups of molecules, atoms or groups of atoms being moved from one place to another, as distinct, again, from moving electrons around. You can think of group transfer as being involved in building up and breaking down of molecules, if you like. Okay. So B vitamins. Wonderful. Um, also, something I haven't listed here is minerals. As we'll see, one of the other proteins that's pre that's present in high concentration is meat. In meat is myoglobin. One of the main ingredients of myoglobin is actually not protein, but an iron atom. So, and we're all familiar with the idea that we can derive iron. So we see that we get protein, vitamins, minerals. Very complete food uh, in one place very concentrated in many of these important nutrients, which is why meat became such an important part of the human diet as we're struggling to establish ourselves as a species. The bad, of course, there's always a bad side, is that meat can be high in saturated fats. Now, what are saturated fats? Let's remind ourselves. Single versus double bonds, right, along that fatty acid chain. If you don't remember what I'm talking about, go back to the first lecture. Uh, but the chemical ramifications of saturation or unsaturation is that we become solid or liquid fats. So saturated fats, that is single bonds, those all are linear chains, and they pack together very nicely. And that, that means that they have low... Uh, high melting temperatures, that is, and they form solids at room temperature, whereas that's lard, right, animal fat, whereas a lot of vegetable fats are higher in uh, unsaturated fats, and those double bonds put a kink in the molecule, and they don't pack together as well, lower melting temperature. Interestingly, for in meat, in uh, most, most mammalian tissue, we pack the we pack the fat in intramuscular adipocytes. What does that mean? So intramuscular, first of all, within a particular muscle, piece of muscle tissue. Adipocytes, what's that? Well, that's a specific, a specific cell type dedicated to the, to the accumulation and storage of lipids or fats. Adipose tissue, you might think of. Um, basically a cell that's filled with an oil droplet. Or uh, if the melting temperature of the fat that's being stored or the lipid that's being stored is um, high enough, then maybe a solid, a solid crystal as well. Intramuscular adipocytes mean muscles have a ready energy supply in, uh, in f of fat, and fat is a wonderful energy source. Um, it's very dense relative to carbohydrates. I'll mention that again in a moment. So dispersed throughout the muscle as opposed to, and we can think of other ways of storing fat. For example, in, for example, in humans, we often see a large accumulation of ad abdominal fat, not dispersed within a muscle particularly, um, and not a wonderful energy source for that muscle uh, in times of need. Also, you can think of m marine mammals, such as dolphins and whales, that have very heavy layers of blubber, that is lipid, uh, just, um, just beneath their um, uh, epithelium. Okay, fat is wonderful, right? Imparts great flavor, and again, that has to everything to do with what we've been selected to think is good flavor because compared to vegetable matter, protein, the protein and fats and vitamins that are present in high density in meat uh, is a very powerful nutrient source, and so it tastes good to us. Um, we will see fat as marbled, again, intramuscularly marbled throughout a piece of muscle tissue, and that is a, a metric of what good, excuse me, what good meat is. Another bad point about meat tissue is that along with the saturated fats, meat tends to be high in cholesterol. And what can we say about cholesterol? One, something we're familiar with is the idea of good and bad cholesterol. We won't go so deeply into the mechanics of what good and bad cholesterol is. Suffice it to say that cholesterol is usually 
in the blood associated with something called the lipoprotein. We've, we discussed this as well early in the semester. The good lipoproteins are the ones that are carrying the cholesterol away from the, the extremities, away from the tissues. The bad cholesterol is associated with lipoproteins carrying lipids out to the tissues, right? So we're going to take the cholesterol out to the tissues and leave it there. That's, those are low-density lipoproteins, and those are considered bad, again, because they're taking the, the, they're taking the cholesterol to the tissues to stay as opposed to bringing it back to the liver for disposal. High-cholesterol diets are associated with heart, di heart disease and cancers.